so um, thanks everyone uh, and thanks for the well pretty nice introduction uh, I could say it was very creative and, and excellent but it was pretty dry uh, just the way I like it so that's fine um, so we're going to talk a bit more about uh, Caldera first of all I'd like to thank all of you uh, because this is a pretty late session well actually the latest one or the last one of today I was a bit afraid that no one would be here but at least some of you showed up so I'll, I'll take that as a win already which is good as hey, that's okay. super interaction here already so uh, it's going great um, so maybe a bit more about what we're going to talk about um, first one slide about me just what do I do um, I'm that guy uh, I look different a bit maybe now because I have a flamingo on my shirt which is apparently a hot topic uh, I work at Envisa which is a European cybersecurity firm so we do the typical consulting stuff pen testing forensics you, you name it that's the kind of stuff we do uh, I also teach courses for science so I do a couple of those things there as well uh, my main background is well it's a bit in between uh, so I used to do pen testing all the time that was uh, when I first started working that's uh, my golden years uh, when 2000 to about 2012 the only thing I really did was penetration testing and, and a bit of red teaming that kind of stuff um, those were the days when I used Metasploit all over the place and I thought I was being 1337 it's like oh no one's no one sees what I'm doing so I'm, I'm good I'm <laughs> but funny thing was that I, I wasn't that good most people were just not paying attention uh, which is one of the things we'll talk about uh, today um, looking at how we can do this better and how we can make blue teams detect more that's a bit the idea so they always said you have to start with a joke just kidding no no one ever said that but i i introduced it so there we go uh, why are assembly developers usually wet because they work below sea level amazing that's, that's the entire crowd oh, boom uh, so topics for today first of all what is adversary emulation just talking a bit more about what we're trying to achieve here what are we doing uh, and how does it compare to other activities uh, then we'll look into uh, some tools of the trade so we'll talk about typical tools that are available to do adversary emulation uh, how they work my experiences with them how I've liked them or not liked them um, and how you can use them to your benefit of course it does depend on what you're looking for not every tool is suited for a specific objective uh, all depends on what you're trying to achieve then we're going to discuss Caldera, of course, which is the big one. Uh, and we'll do uh, quite some demos on uh, Caldera plugins, uh, using it, using it in different ways, seeing how we can customize it, add additional functionality, uh, which is rather impressive. Um, the goal, of course, is to get you all thinking about, hey, maybe we can use this too, uh, and actively start developing modules as well, uh, because it's not that hard, actually, which is nice. Uh, who's ever heard of Caldera or used it? few of you and maybe half of you oh, interesting nice uh, so we'll talk a bit more about how does it work last year they I think around April or May they released a new version since then it's been a bit unstable uh, now unstable is a big word but they've just been developing like well like nutters so it's going very quickly uh, but there's a lot of things you can do and you can add to it uh, which is very nice you can't really call it a, a bad tool because it it's only as good as how you use it that's basically the idea which is nice so first up, what is adversary emulation? What are we trying to achieve here? Uh, I think it's important to make a distinction here. Of course, on the left-hand side, you've got your typical vulnerability scanners, uh, everything, pen testing. Uh, this is not necessarily penetration, uh, adversary emulation. Uh, it's something I see quite frequently as a consultant. You can already imagine, oh, we're going to do adversary emulation. The first step is we're going to launch a Nessus scan. And of course, uh, whoa, which isn't a bad idea, right? I, I don't mind Nessus, why not? Or an exposed quality, whatever you want to do. But that's vulnerability scanning. Uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen a lot of APT or actual adversaries use Nessus in their way of doing things it's kind of like it's a machine gun right <laughs> it's kind of pretty obvious uh, on the other hand you've got typical pen testing right I do a penetration test so I do Nessus but then I do metal sprite right that's the idea so I find a vulnerability but now I also exploit it because that makes me the not a vulnerability scanner uh, that's also not adversary emulation and then finally you could say well we do a red team so it must be adversary emulation well maybe it depends are you actually emulating a real adversary? That's a pretty good question because it does depend. Uh, the, it's a bit of a weird thing. It's a bit small as well, but so the caption says, we are the UN Wiener inspectors, which is a bit weird. But the point there is, it's not because you've got some kind of crazy creative red team, which does something wild which gives them access to your environment or even physically because they break into your building it doesn't mean that that's adversary emulation because 
What is adversary emulation? It's about going for a realistic adversary. Who is the adversary to your environment or your organization? It depends, right? So you have to first do that thinking. What does a typical adversary do? So the whole point is using TTPs, so known tactics, techniques, and procedures that you know are being used against you to emulate how that goes and to what extent you can actually deal with that, whether you prevent that or you detect that. That's the whole point. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK, of course, which I don't have to introduce because if you haven't heard about MITRE ATT&CK, you've been living under a rock for the past couple of uh, months or years even. Uh, so that's a pretty nice database of techniques, tactics that are typically abused by adversaries. They even link them with certain adversaries, which is nice. So pen testing versus adversary emulation, left hand side pen testing, right? Identify and exploit. You go for a specific scope, right? I want you to pen test this system. Excellent. So I'll launch my scans and I'll see what I find. Or even if I do it manually, point this, you're quite often limited to a certain scope. When you look at adversary emulation, you assess the resilience. How well does this organization either prevent or detect? these kind of attacks. So what do they do? What kind of security controls have they implemented? But the point there is, you're typically not limited to a certain scope or a lot less bound to a certain scope. You emulate an adversary how they would work, which is nice. On the left-hand side, of course, you mostly focus on prevention, a bit less on detection, while, of course, with emulation, it's about both. That does require you to have a blue team. There's no, <laughs> there's no point of doing adversary emulation if there's no detection going on. Uh, which brings me to this one. Uh, I'm going a bit quicker here because this is the basics. Red versus purple, right? It's a new thing, right? So it's, now we're purple. It used to be red versus blue, now it's all purple. Or we're, I don't know what color we are, it doesn't really matter. The whole point is we're trying to make sure that everyone gets better. The traditional red versus blue is definitely a good idea. It works, uh, but it works to a certain extent. Red versus blue means that there's assessment. Red assesses how blue does its thing, which is a good idea. Doesn't necessarily mean that blue is actually improving, because to be fair, red is only there to improve blue. If you are any kind of commercial organization, you do not need a red team to do anything else but make your blue team better, which is fine. I mean, it's, a very good, it's, still, it's still a very good reason for being there. But that's important to note, is that you use the red team to make the blue team better. But typically, they assess, right? They, let's say you have a traditional red versus blue, so red is doing things, blue doesn't really know about it, right? They're seeing how well that works, and there's no, not a lot of communication, there's no real feedback loop. And then, of course, at the end of the thing, there's a report. Boom, here it is. That's how well you did. Could be good, could be bad. But the whole point of the purple part, or red and blue, or call it better red, I don't know how you want to call it, is instead of just assessing, we actually try to improve. So immediately, we emulate a certain technique, something that an actual adversary does, and we try to figure out, did we see this? And red could even be in the sock, right? They could even literally be next to the blue team saying, oh, let's try this. Did you see it? If you didn't see it, why not? Because you're missing certain locks, because you're missing certain use cases, but let's try to fix it. That's the idea. Of course, there we can use MITRE ATT&CK, we can use all of this stuff, tactics and techniques. Uh, we all know about this one, right? So that's MITRE ATT&CK, tactics, techniques, tactics at the top, techniques at the bottom. We all know this common knowledge. So imagine you've got component object model, uh, model hijacking, com hijacking, which is, me personally, I think it's a very underrated uh, thing. <laughs> I don't think it gets the attention it deserves. It's madness. It, it works really well. It's a very nice way of doing persistence. Uh, so we've got a lot of documentation in MITRE ATT&CK explaining, one, what is it? So how does it work? Who typically uses it? So we get some information about these are the typical adversaries who use it. And of course, information about how we could potentially detect or mitigate this one. Right? So we know, OK, this is how we could potentially do something about this, which is nice. Gives us a solid base of information. So how do you use attack? Well, a couple of things you could do. Emulation, which is the primary part, of course, of what we're talking about today. But there's other means. There's other things you could do with MITRE ATT&CK. You could map your detection capability. You could use it to classify or analyze or even categorize your threat intelligence, right? Look at all of that information you have. Oh, this host name is bad, right? It's threat intelligence. You've got like a feed with IOCs coming in, right? Depends on what you have, of course, but there's a host name which is bad. So, okay, but what does it mean? I don't know. Is it, where is it used? 
does someone use it as a command and control server? Is it used to drop another payload? So you could, of course, categorize and make your threat intel more valuable by mapping it to my threat tag. That on the side. Of course, prioritization of defenses. If you're not preventing or detecting a technique, it might be worth prioritizing to look into, OK, should we improve on this, yes or no? A uh, small note on this as well. I've seen a couple of organizations try to fix this by saying, well, we'll just do <laughs> MITRE attack. Of course, why not? Just slay of hand, poof, there we go, MITRE attack, sorted. Uh, do not treat all the techniques as one or as the, well, the same value, if you will, because they're not equal. They have a certain weight to them. Some of them are more important than others. Which ones are, of course, relevant to you? <laughs> That's an important one. It's not the Holy Trinity. Uh, there are quite some gaps in MITRE attack. It's not plenty because they're pretty exhaustive, but there are things which are not on MITRE attack. I checked today, for example, credential dumping, which I'll discuss in the next one as a good example. It's huge. It includes almost everything. Like, oh, you've got credential dumping from ELSAS using Mimikatz. You've got dumping credentials from the registry. You've got dumping credentials using DC Sync. You've got dumping the NTDS.dit. It's one technique that's literally 10 different attacks and 10 different detection methods, which is interesting, right? So you cannot just say it's one or zero, that specific technique. It's a lot more than that. So yeah, that's basically what that slide says. Don't consider it as the holy thing, the thing you absolutely have to do. And this is what I wanted to mention. Uh, this is credential dumping. So this is the Windows SAM Security Accounts Manager, of course, which stores your local credentials. Um, question. How would you detect someone stealing your SAM, the SAM file, or dumping it? OK, carry on. No response. Well, there's a couple of options. Uh, but if they're doing it from disk or potentially exporting it from the registry hives, you probably want to be looking at command line interaction, maybe. It's a bit lame, I know, but that's one of the options that you could use. Uh, there's different other ones, but cache credentials is something else. Right? It's the same technique, cache credentials. Cache credentials are used by the system when you don't have direct access to the domain controller. So it uses cache credentials to authenticate a domain user. Perfectly fine. But that's another way of detecting. NTDS, right? copying the NTDS DIT file from the domain controller, using the volume shadow copy service, for example. Again, a completely other thing. And then, of course, using DC Sync. How do you detect DC Sync? This is an interesting room. <laughs> Maybe I should, no, I, I'll leave the jokes for later. Let's focus first on the content people. So DC Sync, how can you detect DC Sync? What is DC Sync? It's about replication, right? You replicate from one domain controller to another one. It's perfectly fine. OK, unless someone replicates from a workstation to a domain controller, it doesn't make any sense. This uses a very specific Microsoft protocol called MSDSR, which is the Microsoft Directory Replication Service Protocol which you should never see between a workstation and a domain controller. If you have any kind of segmentation in place, your workstations are probably ne not next to your domain controllers, I hope. Or there's something in between which is actually looking at what's going on in between those systems. If you don't, you'll not see it. But you can see that's very different than the other ones. So that's yeah, quite a few interesting pitfalls. Another one, another variant, but all of this one specific technique. So you prioritize, you rate one, the overall popularity of the technique. So how important is it? And you could say, well, Eric, but how do we know how important it is? Well, two main criteria. The first one is how popular is it on a wider scale? And there it's pretty straightforward because MITRE, Katie Nichols, who is the lead threat intel at MITRE, and of course, uh, the guys from Red Canary, I don't remember the name, is the CEO actually of the, the firm. He uh, co-presented with Katie Nichols about what are the most common techniques they see being used. They did that in February 2019, and they came up with seven techniques which are most prevalent, which are used all the time by adversaries. You probably want to look for those seven. Maybe, I don't know, just to start, random thought. Maybe look for those first. If you get a bit more mature, look at your overall relevance of threat actors for your organization. Who are you dealing with? Is it APT28? Is it APT29? I don't know. Or any non-APT, I don't know, but who's important? Who's coming after you and what techniques are they using? That's another thing that should, of course, influence what you're prioritizing. 
So you develop an emulation plan, right? So because we're talking about emulation and adversary emulation, what would we do? We would develop a plan saying, okay, let's do this red team or purple team, however we want to call it, what are we trying to achieve? We structure it according to different phases. And in every phase, we execute certain techniques. For example, this is one developed by MITRE themselves. It's the APT3 emulation plan. So what does the APT3 emulation plan look like? They've done quite some things. Set up a C2 channel, uh, get initial access in phase one, so the number of things, preparation as well. In phase number two, we compromise a host, we do some lateral movement, we dump credentials, all of that stuff. But we do, well, most of the things we need to do to reach our objectives. And finally, in, of course, phase three, we collect what we need and we try to exfiltrate it, for example. Very simple, very straightforward. It's an emulation plan. So you build your own, and you set up your infrastructure, you start doing discovery, you start getting initial access, you start running through all those different steps, you select the techniques which you think are most important, and of course you report back on that. Now, if you would ask me as a consultant, Eric, can you do adversary emulation for us? I would tell you, of course. Here's an emulation plan, 200 techniques, 200,000 euros. But that doesn't work, right? <laughs> no one has unlimited budgets or efforts. You want to select, of course, as we already mentioned, the ones that are most relevant to you. So you could co come up with something like this, APT28, all known to use these specific techniques. So we develop an emulation plan to run through these. Not every single plan needs to run through every single tactic, right? You can be creative. The one thing which would be nice, though, if you could make this repeatable. If you could rate, okay, but how well are we doing now versus tomorrow, versus next week, versus next year? And that gets annoying when it's all fully manual, right? And that's where Caldera comes into play. Now, enough with the intro about what adversary emulation is all about. Let's look at some tools, right? How can we do this? What can we use? What can we leverage to get this done right? On the left-hand side, you've got everything which I call automated or scripting or, well, things that do automated adversary emulation, if you will. On the right-hand side, you're looking at more manual stuff. You're looking at typical metasploits, uh, Faction C2, Covenant, um, even Cobalt Strike. Uh, I got rid of Empire because they stopped, well, supporting it a few months ago, but still very effective, although PowerShell at the moment is... Well, PowerShell used to be what I call a dumpster fire. It's not really a dumpster fire anymore. It's pretty hard to get things done in PowerShell, uh, but more on that in a second. So what does that look like? Well, simple things, right? Atomic Red Team. You just run through some techniques. It's very manual. Atomic Red Team is an excellent knowledge base, which is primarily maintained, if you will, not on their own, by the guys over at uh, Red Canary. Uh, but of course, they have many contributors. But the idea is they develop very simple atomic tests, if you will, which are literal command lines. Right? For example, this one, it's using bits admin to download a specific payload. It's one of the techniques. You don't need to install any kind of tools. You don't need to get a, a Metasploit interpreter, um, a Covenant grunt, or anything, um, anything of that stuff. You don't need to get anything of that running. You just run that specific command line, and you see what you get back. Does it work? Does anyone detect that I ran that? Interesting. So it's very manual work. Uh, very effective, though, all free, easy to contribute to, so it's not a bad idea to use these. This is not something you would use in a red team. Contrary to the name, it's something you would use as a blue team to test how well do I actually detect that specific technique. So you try to convert MITRE attack techniques in one or two lines of very simple commands. Straightforward. Uber Meta, a bit less well known, mainly developed by Chris Gates, um, which I think he might be a well, more well known by his um, nickname, which is uh, Carnal Onuch on Twitter. Uh, that's Chris Gates. So he developed this one, which uses Vagrant and uh, VirtualBox to spin up uh, machines as well and to just run commands as well. Very similar, uses YAML files for configuration. You specify what specific commands you want to run, and again, it emulates that kind of stuff. Nice. <laughs> This, I was going to say this is my favorite, but I shouldn't say it because Caldera should be my favorite, but this is Infection Monkey. Has anyone ever ran Infection Monkey? You're all missing out. This is the most amazing tool ever. So what does Infection Monkey do? Well, it acts like a monkey. So you get it, you stage it with PowerShell, or a b you can also use a binary if you really want to, but that infects a system. But then the monkey does what the monkey, well, 
it does what the monkey does, right? So, which is kind of unstructured. So you get something like that. So uh, the animation just slightly touch off uh, almost, but that's what it looks like. So you get this entire infection map and it starts moving from one system to the other. It doesn't think though. There's no logic behind it. It's not, oh, I'll use this specific technique. No, it's like, it's got SSH. Brute force it. It's, just, uh, it's got SMBV1. Exploit it. So it doesn't care. There's no, there's no strategy. You, you do not tell the monkey what to do, right? The monkey doesn't care. The monkey does its own thing, which is interesting. Right? I wouldn't run this in a production environment, though. But uh, well, might make sense, right? Who knows what you find out? So it starts running around, and it generates what we call an infection map, which is interesting. So you can see here on this small legend, you've got an initial. Uh, island, if you will, which is the C2, which is like almost in the middle, a bit to the left. And then you can see the monkey, which is on uh, a Linux system over there, the 10.0.3.6.8. And then it managed to pivot through some other systems. You've got some tunneling going on to connect back to the C2 server. All pretty nice, but again, very uncontrolled. This is not proper controlled emulation, right? Because what this thing does give you at the end, it actually, yeah, animation. <laughs> It comes back with, I, I forgot about the animation, sorry. Um, it comes back with a report saying, hey, you've got these vulnerabilities, this, hi this is how you should fix them. Not bad, but bah, we deserve more, right? It needs to be a bit more structured. Uh, sliver is an ill, oh, mistake on the slide. This should be Sliver. It's still Sliver, but the title says Covenant. Uh, sliver is a very nice one. What's Sliver? Developed by Bishop Fox. Uh, which is an American firm, pretty well known for some of their pen test services that they offer. Uh, what does Sliver do? It's currently in alpha state, but it aims to be a stealth implant for adversary emulation. The idea of Sliver is that you deploy it manually, so you put it somewhere on a system. Again, it's always the same thing, right? Get an implant going. There was once, there was a Twitter rant uh, a few weeks ago, I think by Tim Medine. <laughs> who was going bollocks about, he said, look, can we please decide on a name, right? Because some are using it an agent, others are calling it an implant. Covenant calls it a grunt. Uh, these guys call it something else, so it keeps on going, which is interesting. But So one name, I'll call it an agent, a, a grunt, whatever you want it to be, but you have an implant on a system, right? Which is, uh, in this case, a sliver implant. One of the nice things sliver does it tries to catch the blue team, which is a nice change of dynamic, right? Because it's usually red trying to catch blue. So how does Sliver work? In every binary that's used to execute the implant, they add, of course, the real C2 information because it needs to be in there to, well, set up a C2 channel. But it also includes a canary C2, which is a DNS name that they put in clear text in the binary. The whole point is, if some blue teamer catches it and just runs strings against it, it's like, oh, look, here's the, here's the host name. That must be the C2. If they try to resolve it, then, of course, Sliver catches them. That's the idea. Well, it's not perfect, but it's an interesting train of thought. It's like deception by the red team, which is uh, nice. So they built that in, uh, which is pretty impressive. And, of course, uh, Covenant. Uh, this one, big fan, very impressive work. Uh, these are the guys uh, from Spectrops. Uh, more specifically, this is a Kobber, who used to be one of the, well, some of the main guys as well behind uh, Empire. Well, not 100%, but this is more of a follow-up after Empire. So Empire, of course, everyone knows Empire, which is a very nice framework. Uh, but of course, since Microsoft decided to get their act together and kind of... <laughs> clean up PowerShell, if you will. Uh, Empire is a bit hard to use. Uh, I don't have to tell you. If you're a pen tester, you, you deal with things like MZ with constrained language mode, script block logging. Uh, it's pretty messy to get proper PowerShell execution. It's still feasible, but it's a lot less feasible than it used to be. Uh, so we now have Covenant, which is very similar, if you look at the interface as well, but it's more focused on .NET. So that basically moving away from PowerShell and showing, look, this is all the stuff you can do with .NET, which is also pretty crazy. Uh, so definitely have a look at this one. If you're ever in the market for a new implant system, uh, all pretty, pretty nice, pretty effective. All of this, however, is manual stuff. Things that you deploy manually, and then, of course, you have to start manually running through all of your commands. There's even uh, purple team automation, which is... Um, developed by Praetorian, uh, what they've done is they've actually taken Metasploit and they've <laughs> written a whole bunch of post modules for Meterpreter, which are all trying to do like lateral movement, MITRE tech techniques, they're all mapped to MITRE tech as well. But all that stuff is manual. It's hard to reproduce and it's hard to run in a proper production environment, if you will. So what's the idea? 
Well, how about we use an automated tool, something that structured this in a good way that we can start detecting things, right? And that's where we get into Caldera. Now again, a new version was pretty recently released, so it's, it's kind of like in the making, and you'll notice that a lot of the stuff is uh, pretty, uh, <laughs> you'll see during my demo, sometimes the web interface doesn't load well, so you have to refresh and you have to do this and restart the database. It's sometimes a bit nasty, but it's pretty nice. Uh, there's a very, there's a bit of a trend nowadays. You see more and more commercial vendors trying to sell these kind of products as well. Uh, some of these do it with, dare I say it, machine learning or AI, right? That's the whole idea. It's like, oh, but this thing is very automated. Caldera doesn't do anything like that, right? It's not the point. Caldera is pretty stupid in that sense that it's a structured approach. You tell it to do A, it does A. It's very simple. You tell it to ABC, it does ABC. You tell it to ACB, it does ACB. It's very simple. If it hits a wall, it stops. It doesn't know how to deal with a certain defense because you didn't tell it how to deal with a certain defense, which is fine. I mean, we're emulating here. This is assistance, right? It's not some kind of a magic solution. So what does it look like? Uh, developed by Mitre as well, so it's nice. <sighs> yeah. But Again, if you look at their GitHub, you'll see that uh, they're committing all the time. It's pretty crazy how many plugins that they're adding and things that they're changing. Uh, they uh, reshuffled the entire thing, and since then, it's, it's been uh, pretty impressive to see how it moves along. So this is a very quick uh, Caldera walkthrough. So the main component in Caldera is what we call an ability. What's an ability? It's the execution of a certain technique. Now, Caldera relies on implants on different systems which are deployed upfront, right? It doesn't do initial intrusion. That's not the point. There's already something running, and that thing will then start doing things. Running mitre attack techniques, and it's those techniques that you want to try to detect. That's what it tries to help with. So you deploy a certain agent, and I'll get back to it in a second. Once that's deployed, you can start doing things. You can start running abilities. What's an ability? It's this kind of stuff. For example, it uses a specific ID, which is a UUID 4. <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. If you want to actually create an operation, you cannot reference the ability name. You have to reference the actual ID. And there's no drop down button. <laughs> so it's kind of a. <laughs> It's a bit rough around the edges, if you will. Uh, so you have to actually remember the number, which is nice. Uh, so there we go, credential access T1003, credential dumping, run PowerCats, use PowerCats to execute Mimikatz. This is a built-in technique. You can see there what's the actual command that it runs. The Caldera implant is a PowerShell-based implant, which means that any command you'll see here, when it's Windows-driven, it's going to be PowerShell execution, because it does PowerShell execution. That's what it does. Okay. So what, we, what do we see here? Well, very simple. It's just downloading uh, Invoke Mimikatz, and it's trying to run it. But it's pretty straightforward. That's a pretty simple built-in technique, or ability, if you will. You have groups. So what are groups? Those are a collection of systems that you deploy it on. So what should you deploy Caldera on? Well, typically not on your production environment, right? Because you could say, well, excellent, right? <laughs> Fire the red team. We just deploy Caldera everywhere. It's a backdoor, right? You've literally deployed the backdoor everywhere. Also, <laughs> you actually have to facilitate Caldera. Because if you have script bot roaming, if you have MZ, the anti-malware scanning interface, which I'll get back to in a second, that's going to hurt Caldera. It doesn't like it. It doesn't deal well with it. So you don't deploy it in a production environment. You deploy it in a test environment. A couple of systems, a domain controller, something realistic with security controls that you might have in real life as well. Just bear in mind what you would, you, if you break out there, of course, it kind of defeats the purpose. The agent needs to run. It's very effective, though, from a detection perspective, right? So you have a small, uh, small test environment, very similar to production, but you feed all of the logs into a production seam or elastic stack or Splunk, whatever you want to use. You put all the logs in there, and then you try to hunt for the actual techniques. So you know if your production rules would detect something like that if it actually gets executed. That's kind of the point. That's what we're trying to achieve here. So here we have it deployed on a couple of Windows systems and one Linux system. It's just a small screenshot. It's cross-platform, so it's got Mac OS as well. Uh, works pretty well. And then you can start creating what we call an adversary. An adversary consists of a number of phases, and a number of phases consists, of course, of abilities. Those are those MITRE tech techniques. So here we see a um, screenshot of the built-in uh, 
adversary, which is the nosy neighbor, which is pretty, well, it's nosy, but it's also very noisy because it runs almost everything, which is in Caldera. More on that in a second. And then, of course, it starts running. And you get some live feedback on what it's doing, what's going on, and so on. So here we can see host number one, unsetting the history. It starts running through all of the steps. Uh, bear in mind that it does take a bit of time because everything runs live, of course. It's doing all of that as you go along. So how do you get it up and running? Straightforward, just run this PowerShell command. <laughs> so, <what? laughs> so I'm just uh, running this PowerShell command to get a sendcat.exe running, uh, which is my executable. Uh, and then it, it connects back to, of course, a certain endpoint, which in this case is the c2.malicious-actor.com port 888. You can even specify the groups that it should join, because you can add multiple groups to split up certain systems into different groups that you want to treat differently in Caldera. Pretty straightforward. You use PowerShell. As I mentioned, uh, you could say, well, OK, Eric, but you've got script block logging. You've got constraint language mode, AMSI. Uh, what's script block logging? It's some pretty decent logging. It's event ID 4104, uh, which kind of <laughs> logs all the things. If you enable script block logging, there's no way of doing stealth PowerShell without getting another executable or a binary like insecure PowerShell, for example. Uh, but proper normal PowerShell execution is going to be caught, of course, because it's very strong. It's pretty effective. There's constrained language mode, which, of course, limits PowerShell to the basics, which is going to break a lot of this execution. And there's AMSI, which is the anti-malware scanning interface, uh, which is, well, a real-time interface between your scripting engine, like PowerShell, and, for example, your Defender ATP or AV engine to check, hey, the script that I'm going to run, is it malicious or not? I can tell you, if you run the PowerCats module, which runs Mimikatz, and MZ is enabled, no way, right? It's never going to work. Even constrained language mode is going to trigger and say that's not something you should be doing. So do note that this is always going to be the case. So the idea here is not to detect the actual agent, but to detect and to see how well the techniques are being blocked or detected. So that's the entire thing in one very impressive slide, if I say so myself. Uh, all of the abilities there, and then you can see, OK, is it PowerShell, OS X, or Linux? And then it starts running onto the different groups. Uh, it can be groups that you name custom, like Foo and Bar. Could be Windows, OS X, or Linux, and so on. It all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Let's do a small first demo before we continue. I don't do videos. I do it live. And now everything breaks. Of course, I'm using Kali because. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, this is a Caldera stack that we've got up and running in our lab environment. Uh, of course, I'm running it in dark mode. Of course. Uh, I'm not running the shell in dark mode because that would be unreadable. So what do we have here? Uh, let me just show you very quickly. Uh, this is one system, which is a Windows 10 machine, which is just hosted somewhere in my lab environment. Uh, it's actually spun up using Ansible, so I sp spun up a number of machines. Uh, there's a DC there, there's some, an elastic machine for monitoring, there's some Ubuntu machines, uh, Windows 10, uh, Windows Server 2019, a whole bunch of systems connected. Okay, this is one of them. So let's have a look. Uh, we've got three modules here, or three plugins. Uh, at the top of Caldera, there's one attack, which is kind of lame. It's just a locally hosted attack framework. OK, it's not even the navigator. It's fine, OK, but I could, I could also go online, so I'll just leave it at that. That's fine. Thank you for adding that. The chain is, of course, the big one. Uh, what's the chain? It has all of the functionalities, all of the capabilities. So what can we do in the chain? Let me maybe zoom in a bit. Okay, no zooming for now. There we go. Excellent. <clears throat> so we've got uh, groups, abilities, facts, adversaries, operations. If you go into the groups, here you can see all of my different systems. I've got some Windows machines, Linux, Windows, uh, as I showed you in the screenshot. You get some information whether or not they're, um, <laughs> they're running or whether they're checking in. All of these systems are currently online. If anyone's in the audience, and I know one or two are, who's connected to our lab environment, if you now kill the stack, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> Small warning. Uh, so here's the abilities. So here we have all of the abilities. Um, you can see the attack tactics. So they're divided amongst tactics. And then you can go into the different techniques which are available, which are translate as abilities. Uh, for example, collect the ARP details on Windows. Well, 
G, Eric, it's impressive. ARP dash A, right? So show me the ARP table. It's pretty simple. Okay, but it's one technique which is essentially also being used by adversaries. So you could write your own very quickly, of course, to add things like this. Uh, there's a couple of more, well, fancier ones. Uh, let me have a look. Yeah, the install cryptography is pretty lame. Privilege escalation, yeah, weak executable files. Credential access is pretty big. Uh, for example, here you have, well, get computers, run power cats, credentials in registry, finding private keys, running prog dump. It's a new one. More on that in a second. Execution, so you can find your different ones. Run DLL execution is a new one that we added as well. I'll explain a bit more on that in a second. So you've got different uh, things that you can add. It's always the same thing, right? It's a command. It's all PowerShell driven. If it works in a PowerShell shell, you can also run it like that in an ability, if you will, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, facts, uh, this allows some further customization. So here, for example, you can add usernames or passwords that can be used by the different abilities in Caldera. If you would like to connect using a certain username or password, you can add those things inside the facts, or even brute forcing that kind of stuff. Uh, you can customize that a bit more. So you don't have to do it at an ability level, you can do it in the facts as well. Then, of course, there's the adversaries, uh, which show you this, uh, all of the different phases that they went through and all the different techniques that they run. So if you run this adversary, well, it's going to be fun. Uh, so let's have a very quick look. Uh, let's add one. My GUI is a bit messed up, of course, because I zoomed in. Uh, but let's add this one here, test one. Oh, Jesus Christ. Keyboard layout. Nosy neighbor, right? Why not? Because I'm lazy. I'll just run this on all of my Windows machines. Uh, I don't want cleanup. You can actually get Caldera to clean up the artifacts that it drops as well, because you can make Caldera drop additional executables. Imagine that you, for example, want to run actual Mimikatz. You don't even want to do PowerCats. You want to actually pull in Mimikatz.exe. It's perfectly fine. You can do it. Uh, but do you want to clean it up afterwards? That's the question, right? So you can add that or you can change that. So let's run this thing. Yeah, this jitter thing is super annoying. There you go. It's running now. Amazing. This is the time where you go and get a coffee and have a chat. Talk to some friends that you haven't seen uh, often. And of course, the nice thing is it shows you the output of the commands as well. I'm clearing the history. It has no output. Superb. Uh, there's more, though. There's more of them coming. So uh, I'll leave this run for a while uh, so you can actually live see what's going on. Uh, I could even notice here on my system now uh, this guy, this is one of the systems in the Windows group, so of course it's a victim, if you will, of this attack. Uh, it will run all of those commands on this system as well. I'll just wait a little bit. Or let's not wait, let's just say, okay, let's create a new adversary, which is a bit more limited, because this is a pretty noisy one. I even prepared a small cheat sheet, because if you, as I mentioned, copying UUIDs or even typing them is a mess, because you have to reference them using this UUID. This is a small feature that Caldera might want to add that you can actually search by name instead of the UUID, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, so this one will actually disable your uh, Defender ATP, for example, or disable real-time protection. It just uses the PowerShell command to get that done. So you can just copy this one and say, for example, okay, let's create an adversary here. Switch the thing to add. This is the Brucon adversary. So it uses the built-in techniques and abilities, of course. Test. Select the phase, phase one. So that's the first step that you want to achieve. And I'll just copy the entire ID in there. Attach. Oh. So this is a nice one. This is the whole thing that I mentioned about the GUI. It actually attached it now to this one, the, <laughs> the nosy neighbor. Never mind. Quick refresh. You guys all love Caldera now, of course. Oh, Eric, it's super stable. There's a couple of those little things in there. Add, brew contest. Excellent. Attach. So we've got it there, nice. So let's add another one. Let's add uh, PowerCats, just see if it works. Uh, and let's see what that one does. Uh, if I'm running it on a system which has uh, no more Defender because I'm the IDs, I'm stopping it in the first phase. So let me see if I can actually do that in the second phase. There we go, attach this one as well. Boom. So it's also overlapping a bit, but that's because of my GUI screen. <laughs> Thank God I'm not selling it, right? So. 
2000 euros. Who wants a license? So there we go. Saved adversary uh, Brucon. So let's have a look at the operations. Uh, the one that I run is still ongoing. Let's have a look at the groups. I'm now going to target one specific system because I don't want to target all of them because then you're going to really fall asleep. Uh, so let's just go for one and I'll call it Brucon quick test. Uh, and I'll select this one machine and I'll add it to my Brucon group, which you'll see here it gets a tag Brucon. So it's now a member of that group as well. So let's add an op another operation which I'll call Brucon. I'll use my Brucon adversary and I'll just target my Brucon thing as well, my Brucon uh, group. Start, boom, starts running. Let's try to disable Windows Defender. Let's have a look. Still running. Ah, it's disabled now, it seems. Actually, don't know if I turn it on. Well, we'll see. We'll see the output in just a second. I was going to do one joke, but I, Twitter ruined it for me. Where did the hacker go? But it's all over Twitter at the moment. You haven't heard? OK. He ran somewhere. OK. Let me just switch here to see if uh, we have to go on with the awkward jokes or if we actually have some output already. So this is uh, my output from the first operation that I'm running. You can see it's running through all of the different Windows hosts. It's getting a lot of uh, info, collecting ARP details. So you can get all of that info here. So here you can see the actual output of an ARP command and so on and so on and so on. Keeps on running, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, again, the GUI sometimes is a bit of a, of a you sometimes have to refresh a bit. Uh, there's <laughs> it's one of those things. Uh, this one is a bit slow, though. It's normal that this one wouldn't have any output, but let's, ah, there we go. It's green. The green part, by the way, it's just based on the status code. So even if the command doesn't exit with an, if the command doesn't exit with an error, but you didn't get the intended result, it will still show green, uh, which is an important remark. It's not that smart to actually realize whether or not your attack actually worked. Uh, but, yeah. We'll know when we're running PowerCats. Let me see if this guy's freaking out already. Not yet. Uh, it seems to be okay-ish. Uh, it's a bit slow, though. My, I'll blame it on the internet. It's actually running locally inside my lab environment. So. Ah, there it is. Ah, so here we can actually see the entire Mimikatz output. And you'll see, oh, secure also acquire a laissez key import. See, look, I dumped credentials. No, I didn't. That's an error message. Uh, it's perfectly acceptable, though, because that's what I predicted. Uh, this is an older ability, which is using the invoke mimikatz.ps1. If you Google it, you'll soon figure out that you need to use a newer version of mimikatz. It has nothing to do with Credential Guard or Elsa's protection. Uh, it's just a small bug in mimikatz on newer versions of Windows. So this shows you need to customize. Excellent. Next part. So you need to customize and you need to build on top of this because it doesn't just all work like that, right? So how do you develop stuff, right? Developing Caldera plugins. So you want to probably start developing your own stuff. And there's a couple of different levels of developing stuff. Uh, fair warning. I'm not a developer. Don't let me anywhere near your code base. I'll write very ugly code that might work, but it's absolutely disgusting. So. So a couple of levels, right? Using built-in adversaries is one. I just showed you. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can build adversaries with existing abilities. That's also what I showed you. I create my own uh, adversary with a custom ability. No, with an existing ability. My bad. Uh, you can develop your own custom abilities, which I'll show you in a second. And you can even develop your own custom plugins. What's a plugin? Well, the entire chain that I showed you, that's a plugin. One of, the thing one of the things Caldera doesn't have, for example, is a nice link to the attack navigator, which would be nice, right? It's MITRE. Why wouldn't they build it? I don't know. They're busy building other things, uh, which is very much appreciated. But we decided to give them a hand, and we build our own plugin to actually export to a MITRE attack navigator view. So you can run your attacks and immediately see inside your attack navigator, okay, what's going on? What do I detect? What do I not detect? Which is pretty nice. Yes, documentation. It's getting better, uh, but since they changed from version 1 to 2, a lot of the documentation is still for version 1. And there's, it's not like version 2 is 30% different, it's 100% different from version 1. So it doesn't really work. You really need to use version 2 documentation to get things done. Uh, so this is a custom ability. You can imagine here, you saw it in the GUI already, this is straightforward. It's easy as pie, if you will. If you know how to write some PowerShell commands, well, congratulations. You can write 
a Caldera ability. So why not start contributing, right? You can add stuff, uh, you can add stuff to the GitHub repo, um, why not, right? Those are things you can definitely do. We've been working quite a bit on this to build more and more of these modules because it's pretty nice in your purple team approach, if you will. Now, yeah, this guy, small word. This is one of the guys who's actually building a lot of the plugins on our side. I decided to also give him a small shout out. It's Maxime, uh, do not recruit Maxime. I will hunt you down and I'll find you. Uh, he's been working on a lot of these plugins. It's pretty straightforward. You can uh, add your own plugins in the plugins folder. Of course, it's all Python. So all the plugins are written in Python. So you do have to know Python to be able to do it. And then you can start enabling them and you can start doing things. So let's have a look at the custom plugin as well. Second one. First one went 100% okay. So back into my Caldera stack. Say that you're not, well, let's say you're not a complete idiot, so you're not using Mimikatz on the system to dump hashes, right? So you have a bit more brains and you think, well, maybe I shouldn't be just running Mimikatz because it's kind of noisy, right? Imagine you're dumping credentials from Elsos. How would you detect Mimikatz? It's a question. I make it clear that that's a question, so I'm expecting feedback. No one. Oh, sorry, yes, sir. That's a nice one. <laughs> look at the number of bytes read from the ELSOS process. That's pretty impressive. I was going to say, look for event ID 10, for example, in Sysmon, and look for access to ELSOS. But it's a bit more prone to false positives in mine. But yes, that's one approach. Very effective. Pretty nice. Uh, a bad idea would be to say, well, I'll look for mimicat.exe, right? Or I'll look for, <laughs> did you see the latest one in Defender, uh, like Microsoft Defender, the latest detection that they added? It's a pretty nice one. If you run notepad.exe, sec your ELSA colon colon log on password, it actually triggers. because it says that's a bad process, which is interesting. So they're just looking for the, the actual arguments you're passing to the command, which is stupid from one side, but it's actually also very effective because there's no reason why someone would run Notepad with Secure also, I would guess, but whatever. I'm going to shut up now. Um, here we have this one, for example, you could say, okay, but let's just adapt this and let's just run power dump, right? So we could just use power, uh, power dump, prog dump. Uh, we can use prog dump, which is a sysinternals tool. It's signed by, well, Microsoft. It's part of sysinternals. It's a proper Microsoft tool. It's not installed by default, but you can very easily add it. Typically, it doesn't get picked up uh, because, well, it's, it's a normal tool. So it might be better to use this one, right? So you could say, okay, but let's just add our own ability. Let's put it under the decent uh, category. <laughs> Keyboard layout. Uh, so that's the reason why my <laughs> my, my portable was sh still showing up because I didn't remove it afterwards. So you can see the 418 one there. Uh, I actually added it a w well a couple of hours ago. You can see there uh, 418 FBD4 something like that. It's not part of uh, your traditional uh, Caldera, if you will. So what does it do? Very simple. Start process because it's PowerShell. Uh, it runs program 64exe It uses the working directory of CU users public libraries because, I don't know, maybe they don't look there. And it just uses uh, ProcDump to dump the lsls.exe process as a file called recorded.dmp. Right? Why not? We can try. Now, that doesn't return it, though, right? Because we still need to obtain that prog dump. The whole idea here is what we're trying to achieve is we're just dumping the ELSOS memory. We'll just retrieve it, recover it on our side, and then, of course, we can just run it offline using Mimikatz. Right? That would be one idea. Uh, so it's a bit more stealth, if you will. So it's another variation of credential dumping, uh, which is nice to start adding these kind of things. It's, of course, part of credential dumping as well. Uh, payload, of course, is prog dump64.exe, because what we have now is an additional payload. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's, it's too late. I actually had my keyboard layout on QWERTY until I, until I decided to walk up to the stage, and I thought I'll just change it to Belgian, and it's even worse. Yes. Those are dots. Oh, Siri. <laughs> I do. So here we have a stockpile, uh, and you can go into the payloads directory, and you can see here, for example, I have a couple of files there. Um, one of them uh, is 699d2e4.dll. One of them that's not there is my prog dump. Uh, why not? Because as I mentioned, I still need to get, put it there. I can just use live.sysinternals.com. 
A couple of options. I could also do this live, right? I could just have my ability download it and then execute it, but I'll just help it a bit and I'll just uh, I'll just put it in. Just throw it here. There we go. Uh, the one thing though is if you add any kind of ability in Caldera, which is also a bit weird, you have to stop it, delete the database, start it again. Which start which sounds very bad, but it's like this. Just get rid of the database, start it again. Because every time it loads the database, it loads all of the new uh, plugins. There we go. And all of the abilities. Boom. Excellent. So let's try again. Let's go in here. Probably have to refresh and re authenticate. There we go. And then you can start adding your own little things. Da -na 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 -na. So I have to recreate my group, of course, because it no longer exists. Uh, that's because I restarted it. Wait for the different systems to come up. Oh, the one, no, no, it's not there yet. No. I'm looking for Win 1001. I'll run it on this one. Oh, there it is. Excellent. Call it test one, two, three. Add group. Boom. It's now in test one, two, three. Excellent. So let's again create a small new adversary. Test one, two, three. The naming convention I'm using is not that effective. <laughs> I'm going to get confused about all of these. Uh, this is the one that I used, so it's 418. Again, uh, it's a bit of a mess. You have to really know which one that you're looking for. I'm going to attach it here. Boom. Mm, I'll put this one in phase two, because just to be sure, I'm going to run the other one first, uh, which is actually going to get rid of Defender. Save it. Test one, two, three, and I run it. Add adversary group. The jitter, by the way, is to add some uh, randomness in the communication between the actual agent and the C2, if you will. Depends if you're actually if you actually want to test whether you pick up on the C2 as well. Start doing the same thing. Starts trying to disable Windows Defender. To be fair, it probably it probably still was disabled. So there you go. Excellent. And we leave that to be. Let's have a look. I'll already go to the right directory, which I think I got. I went for C users public or something like that. Uh, hidden items, excellent libraries. There you go. Record.dmb. So that file was. Hmm. I was going to say that if I was just created right now. It's probably an old one, small artifact. Let me get rid of that guy. <laughs> no, I don't want to open dump hell. Ah, now it's running prog dump. Come on. Red means bad. This is linked to my executable. Uh oh. Didn't I download? Ah, <laughs> I downloaded put them to the wrong directory. <laughs> the dangers of live, demo, live demos, right? If I would do it again now, it would work. I'll run it again, and then I'll, I'll finish up on my uh, blah, blah. <laughs> da, na, na, na. Operations, there we go. Add it again. Test one, two, four, I'll call it this time. So there we go. I'll leave this to run. 
Uh, but that's one part, right? So that's just doing that. It's just running an ability. A uh, couple of other things that you might want to achieve, it's actually still in my demo. You might want to say, okay, but Eric, you're doing a lot of things in Caldera now. It's all isolated in that small segment. Uh, if you go back to the home, uh, you'll actually see that there's an interesting plugin there that we added. So that's Caldex, uh, it's called. Uh, this is a new plugin, if you will. Uh, it doesn't exist in Caldera as such. Uh, we've uh, just created it. Give us one or two more days to clean up the code a bit. <laughs> it, it's pretty dirty. Uh, it's, it's, it's mainly Maxim who actually worked on it. Very impressive work. Uh, but what does it do? It's pretty straightforward. It just creates a JSON response. It actually responds with uh, an entire overview of all different attack techniques that you're using, whether or not those techniques are running successfully on your different systems. Uh, so if you would want, you could just say, okay, give me the raw data. Uh, it's pretty limited now because I've just been running some stupid little um, abilities, if you will. You can just save it up uh, as a small JSON file. I'll just call it uh, whatever. Um, Export to JSON, and then of course you could go to the attack navigator. Uh, you could go here and say, okay, I want to load my own or create my own uh, layer, uh, and you could open existing la layer, which is of course your. Where did I throw it? Uh, throw it here. There we go. Export to JSON. Boom. So what does it do? It basically loads your JSON file and it indicates, okay, what what is actually working here? I just ran credential dumping. It's pretty red. Why? Because it worked. Um, I've been running that a few times, so it actually shows you, look, this is uh, how well you're doing, uh, which is pretty nice. So it's one small plugin. You can only think about, well, there's so many different things you can do, right? You can add on stuff. You can even automate the link in between. Uh, you can adapt. Uh, it's pretty nice to see how, well, it's all open open source, it's all there. Um, let me see if my other module actually stopped running. How are we doing here? <laughs> ah, it's green now. Excellent. So it executed, then why, where's my file? This is interesting though. Test again. Add capitals. Win 10 0 one, yeah, the right one, that's excellent. So, while this one is running, I'll uh, not hold you too long. I'll just go back to the results in a second. The idea here of this talk, just explaining Caldera, uh, we're 26, so it's perfect timing. Uh, pretty nice tool. There's a couple of rough edges in it. You've probably noticed, for example, the GUI isn't always what you would like it to be. You have to reference the abilities with the specific IDs. But the whole idea of the framework is pretty nice because you can customize, you can add things, you can run them in an autom automatic, repeatable way, if you will. And you can even add additional modules. You can add plugins to it to, for example, export stuff that you can then load into your attack navigator. Um, it doesn't replace a proper red team, though. Uh, this is never going to be a tool that, that can be used as part of a red team, even. Not even as part of it because the whole point of Caldera is that you work together with the blue team, you immediately check, okay, but what did you see, what did you not see? The idea is make it repeatable. What you want to avoid is a red team that comes in day one, gets domain admin because they always do, right? That's the, that's the point. They get domain admin, they dump everything and say, like, oh, and then one year later they come back, they do the same thing over and over again. The whole point of Caldera is empowering a blue team to actually look for those techniques themselves. And without having all of that red team knowledge, right, using techniques that have been built, for example, by the red team or even by the community and running them continuously. Run them once every three months, see how well you're doing. Just map it to your attack navigator, get visibility so you actually know what's going to happen. If a red team comes in and destroys your entire organization and you haven't seen a single thing, it probably shouldn't come as a surprise because you should know your coverage and you should know, okay, this is what we should be able to see, that's what we're not able to see. 
So that's the whole point. Uh, two GitHub repositories that we're hosting, uh, one of them is Caldex, which is the export module for uh, Detect Navigator. Uh, it's a pretty nice one if you want to have a look and see how it works, if you want to develop your own. The other one is Caldera Abilities. Give us a few days, though, because we need to clean up some of the code. Um, <laughs> it was a bit of a rush. A bit of, uh, well, plenty of work uh, that we, mostly me, have been doing. <laughs> Not for this presentation, actually. Other things. Uh, good fun. Uh, want to get hacked? Uh, reach out to us. Red teaming, all that stuff. We're happy to do it. Uh, if you're already hacked, then you can also call us. That's <laughs> even worse. Uh, I would say thank you very much, and let me have a look. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom. <laughs> You've got to be shitting me. <laughs> it's green. Why would you make it green? Let's have a look, actually, if my uh, file is actually there. Oh. Ah, I know what's going on. I had an older module in there which was dumping to DMP, and I think it's still cached somewhere in Caldera. So it's actually dumping to my C drive. Uh, that's what's going on now. You can see that those actually were created. Uh, uh, no, also a while ago. Interesting. End of the talk. Thank you. A any questions, maybe, as well? Maybe one final joke, if I may, just to <laughs> close down. What uh, type of gear does uh, or clothing does a uh, hacktivist wear? A uh, hacktivist. A DDoS.